There are many reasons which led to the formation of the Cold War, the first of which was the 1938 Munich Agreement between Britain, France, Czechoslovakia and Nazi Germany. Now, due to this agreement, Nazi Germany could invade Czechoslovakia. Now, Czechs Russia was an ally of Czechoslovakia, or should I say the USSR was an ally of Czechoslovakia, and they were not allowed in negotiations, which helped fuel their mistrust of the Western allies, in particular Britain and France. And they even believed they would work with Nazi Germany to destroy the USSR, especially as both had supported the White Russians in 1918. Now, the next big event was in 1941, with the formation of the Grand Alliance. Now, this is particularly important because two things happen in almost in succession of each other. The first is the Atlantic Charter between Roosevelt and Churchill, which was basically the aims of a post-war democratic Europe, and which the Soviet Union refused to sign, and even Churchill was annoyed that it didn't allow Roosevelt to declare war on Nazi Germany. Now, the second was the invasion of the USSR Operation Barbarossa by Nazi Germany. This was hugely important because all of a sudden Stalin is forced to work with the Western Allies against Germany. As a result, Britain and America both agreed to send aid convoys across the Arctic Oceans uh, to supply arms and food to Stalin. Now, immediately, the alliance begins to take effect. For starters, Britain and Russia both invade Iran, which is a source of oil, and they invade it primarily to get it out of Nazi Germany's hands, but also to make sure that the Russians can use the oil in the fight against the Germans. Now, the first time the Big Three meet is in 1942, the Tehran Conference. Now, in the Tehran Conference which was actually in 1943, sorry, not 1942. Um, by this point, the Allies have invaded uh, North Africa, effectively. And rather than Stalin's initial suggestions of opening a second front in Europe, they have decided to fight, them, fight themselves through North Africa and then up through Italy, which is, which is a problem for a number of reasons. Stalin believes that they're still kind of working with Nazi Germany to see which side is weaker so they can finish either off if they lose. Also, Roosevelt is annoyed because it's kind of Churchill securing British post-war gains, but also it's remarkably ineffective. While they may actually, while they did conquer North Africa and they went through Italy, they had two years of tough fighting in northern Italy, especially once Mussolini is deposed and effectively Nazi Germany controls Italy, which is a major problem. The other reason why the Allies decided to invade through North Africa is because of the Atlantic Wall in France, which was very formidable and a lot of effort, especially after the ill-conceived and ill-received Dieppe raid in 1942. So Stalin gets quite annoyed that the Western Allies aren't really relieving him, they're just supplying aid. There are also many debates that happen at the conference. Normally what the Russians would like or... Um, what would they what do they want to a certain degree for getting in the war? Stalin mainly wants security in the post war. He wants Poland, he wants the Eastern European states, he wants the states that he has annexed under the Nazi Soviet pact. He wants the rights to keep all this territory, and the US and the UK both agree despite it being an Atlantic despite it being part of the Atlantic Charter, or against the Atlantic Charter. They also want him to declare war against Japan, which is arguably incredibly stupid because Nazi Germany is fighting a war against two fronts and therefore loses. And yet they want Stalin to also open a war against two fronts, which again kind of brings more um, evidence to suggest that maybe they did want Nazi Germany destroyed. Also, Stalin begins to propose or show more interest in Roosevelt's idea of the UN, which is also quite influential at a later date. Now, also in 1943, there is a revelation of the Cachin Grave Massacre, which was discovered by the Nazis in the retreat from Russia following successful attempts like the Battle of Kursk and the Battle of Stalingrad. Now, the Germans find that effectively there's been 20,000 dead Polish officers which have been killed by the USSR under the Nazi-Soviet pact, and they immediately announce it to the Western Allies. Now, the Western Allies basically propose a independent commission which goes and finds out what happened to these bodies. Stalin says no, which kind of fuels his distrust. He also breaks away from the Polish government in exile and starts to create his own Polish government with uh, exiled Polish communists, Now, which is also quite important because effectively he's got... Uh, flat pack governments which he can put in when he conquers these territories and in particular future communist leaders like Walter Ulbricht who becomes the first chancellor of West Germany is one of the first is one of the people who are under this puppet government while in 1944 um, the Allies do invade Western, uh, Western Europe with D-Day, Stalin eventually is a bit more conciliary towards them, is a bit happier with them, and even in 1944 actually admits that um, the aid packages that have been received from the Western Allies are the reason that the Soviet Union is still in existence. The other big thing that happens in 1944 is Stalin begins to, the Russian army, sorry, start going outside the borders and they start heading more into Eastern Europe, which is incredibly important because finally the fight is being drawn away from Nazi Germany. One of the 
first things they do is they go into Poland. And at this point, the Polish Home Army, which is supported by the government in exile, rise up against the Nazis in Warsaw, expecting the Soviet government to back them up. What happens is the Soviet government stay on the banks. They refuse to let the Allies drop aid to them. They refuse to get involved in the fighting. And they basically wait three months for the um, Polish Home Army to be utterly crushed by the Nazis. And by this point, there is effectively no organised resistance to the Soviets, and therefore it is quite easy for them to employ their own question of government. And especially as we move more into the Eastern European countries, Stalin, is in, Stalin uses the Red Army and the NKVD, who are the kind of the Soviet secret police, to enforce order and get rid of communist opponents. And remember, communist opponents is not just people who aren't communists in these parties, it's also communists who do not fit in line with Stalin's view of communism. Now, in October 1944, Churchill flies to Moscow to talk with Stalin. Now, the Allies are a bit iffy because they want a more democratic Eastern Europe, whereas Stalin is determined to make them part of his buffer zone, so he's got friendly governments. Now, Churchill and um, Stalin have this discussion where the infamous percentages agreement has come up, basically giving Stalin dominant control in the governments of most in Eastern Europe, with the, pretty much the exception of Greece and Hungary, although Hungary get later gets um, changed from a 50-50 split to a 75-25 split in favour of the USSR. Now, this is extremely important because Roosevelt is not part of this. Because he's suffering a election in 1944, which sees him get elected for a, um, see him get selected for a fourth term, third term, fourth term. Either way, it's very unlikely, and it's now completely impossible under the American legal system. The second of the big three conferences is in Yalta in 1945. At this point, Germany is getting absolutely smashed. Uh, the, uh, the Western Allies are moving through France thanks to D-Day and Operation Dragoon. You've got Arnhem, which has basically put the Western Allies back. You've got the Battle of the Bulge, which has seen the Allies also reeling, while the Soviets on one side are getting completely, you know, they're, they're countering no resistance. And as a result, the Soviet army begins to cause a few problems, more of which I'll be discussing later. At the Yalta Conference on the Black Sea, this shows, this is, a spe this, the location is especially important because it shows how important Stalin is to the Western Allies, especially as Yalta is in the Black Sea. And and Roosevelt is ill at this point, so a long flight is actually very difficult for him. The main thing they discuss is, of course, Germany, basically deciding that Germany should be de disarmed, demilitarized, denazified, and this is spare important because they wanted Nazi war criminals to stand trial for their crimes, and basically they come up with the idea of Germany and Austria, although Austria is not as important, to be split into zones of occupation. The concept of reparations is not completely established because Britain and America both favour a Germany that's begun to become resurgent having seen the mistakes of the Treaty of Versailles. However, Stalin is determined to make Germany suffer for what it has done. However, they do kind of come up with reparations. They decide 20 billion, although more of this is really discussed at Potsdam. And they decide that the Allied Control Council or Allied Control Commission would be govern governing Germany with members from all four powers. The other thing is, is Stalin demands territory from the east up to the Curzon line in Poland, which is its pre-Russia-Polish War 1921 border. And then Germany will gain, sorry, Poland will gain territory from Germany up to the Oder-Nice line, which is incredibly important. Stalin also decides that Eastern Europeans will get free elections, which is also very important important. Uh, there's also the fact that um, Stalin is beginning to look a bit more towards, yes, I'm going to go and invade Japan, which again is also quite important, but he wants more territory. South Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands. And Stalin agrees to join the UN and, that, and generally there's a more important tone between the Allies and they're getting along a lot better. They also discussed Poland, which they decide to have a provisional government of national unity, which is basically a way of them having communist and non-communist people in there. Because at this point, Stalin has established the Lub Lubin government, which is hugely important because this, he, de he declares that these people are the new government of Poland, completely ignoring the government in exile. And the Western allies don't like this. So they want him to have non-communist members in the government. And he agrees to free elections, basically, which is hugely important. There's also the Potsdam Conference, which happens after the... Um, after the defeat of Germany. Now, at this point, Germany has obviously been defeated. Now, just before the Potsdam Conference, you end up with the Senator Vandenberg problem. Senator Vandenberg is a, is a Republican senator in the US who is very anti-Soviet, and he believes the Soviets have been given too many concessions in Eastern Europe, particularly due to Poland, because lots of Poles don't like the fact that they've effectively liberated themselves from the Nazis, and now they've got the Soviets in charge. They're very unhappy. They want a free government, which is the main problem. Now, um... This is why Roosevelt's rights to Stalin, and there's a beginning to be a bit of a breakdown. But anyway, by the Potsdam Conference, you've got a new president, Harry S. Truman, since Truman's died. You've also got Churchill, who's around for the first half of the conference, replaced by Clement Attlee, who's a diehard socialist, who's also quite possibly one of the most impressive prime ministers in British history, due to the fact that Labour were the dominant force in the cabinet. 
The question of reparations is finally decided. 50% of the 20 billion goes to the USSR. They allowed an extra 15% of um, foodstuffs from the Western zone effectively in exchange for industry. So sorry, they um, Westernized get 15% of the food stuff if they get the industry and they get an extra 10%, which is also quite important because of the concessions effectively. Um, the Soviet Union also begins to want to um, declare war against Japan in exchange for the territory which is also hugely important. At this point, Truman's very unhappy because you've got the problems in Greece due to the civil war, which is effectively Stalin's fault, which is also quite irritating. And um, he's no part of the negotiations because he doesn't like the percentages agreements. The other problem with the Potsdam is that the atomic bomb is dropped, which also causes huge, huge stress between them because um, all of a sudden the Soviet Union have, a w uh, don't have no way of attacking the Germans. Oh, sorry, attacking the America, because America have just got this really awesome new weapon, which is a huge, huge problem. The other thing is the UN treaty gets ratified, and two of the Soviet satellite states, which I think is um, Bulgaria and Romania, actually get put in the US, uh, the UN, sorry, but the rest don't. Now, Stalin, after the Potsdam Agreements, begins to develop more of a control over Eastern Europe. He is helped to a degree because the far right have effectively been destroyed by the Nazi menace, and that leaves the far left, who are also considered quite good, namely because they're some of the only surviving resistance members still alive after the Second World War. That and the Soviets have fought for liberation, so they're seen as quite popular to a certain degree in many countries, which is very, very important. Now, depending on the country, depends on how well things went for Stalin. And in Bulgaria and Romania, things went quite well because in Romania there was a communist government already and they were popular, which was all really good. In Bulgaria, it still worked quite well because they just arrested the leader on trumped-up charges and it all went downhill. Hungary was also... Um, it wasn't too bad, actually. Elections were manipulated in rings, you know, classic Stalin almost, to provide the d desired outcome for the communists. Many Hungary and... Uh, communists did not display the degree of loyalty that Stalin wanted. Stalin wants a specific kind of loyalty, which a lot of communists don't have. He, uh, this is at this point, the USSR is known to use salami tactics by dividing the opposition parties between them and only slicing them off one at a time, which is quite important. Poland, uh, there's rigged elections, effectively. Uh, they get a p Deputy PM was Gonka, who was part of the Lubin Committee. He was not fully Moscow, so replaced him by a guy called Beirut, who was much more pro-Stalin. Stalin likes, effectively, pro-Stalinist rulers. Czechoslovakia already, lo the communists are quite popular because of they've given land reforms, uh, land reforms get made that they made them give land to the peasants after the war. The growing opposition was also, um, growing to the communist leadership was quite important. They get Edward, Edward Benes, who was a well-respected and popular leader to take over as well, who was also quite important. However, he stands down, of, he effectively rules a communist-dominated government and then resigns. Uh, Yugoslavia is also a big one because they, liber they liberated themselves and Tito wants to form this kind of like Yugoslav dominated federation with Albania which Stalin doesn't like. They don't want to be puppets because Tito's a nationalist and as a result Yugoslavia eventually get thrown out of the USSR and instead they receive aid from the Marshall Plan. Now, amazed, the two main things which help Stalin consolidate his control of Eastern Europe is the Comiform, the Communist Information Bureau, which again is very important because um, uh, it, it turns all the political parties under the command of the USSR. He's also got Comicom, which is the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, which was also very important because it helped Eastern Europe become kind of economic autarky, dependence with each other, which allowed the Soviets to subsidize things like grain production without involving the US or anybody. But the main six steps that led to the breakdown of the alliance was the control of Eastern Europe, the pressure on Iran because the USSR wouldn't leave in 1946, only when they would... When, the West now, when Iran went to the UN, would they leave? The instability in Greece and Turkey, the Greek civil war and that kind of thing. The Truman Doctrine, which was about um, using effectively um, aggressive means to control communism. The Marshall Plan, by using economic aid to repair Western economies to stop them falling into communism. Canaan's Long Telegraph by George um, F. Canaan, which basically said the Soviet Union is declaring war on the US. The Iron Curtain speech, which was um, basically Churchill being angered that they didn't want to put free elections in and that kind of thing. He compares, um, Stalin compares Churchill to Hitler as a result. It's very unfair with each other. And these are basically the main reasons why the Cold War begins, because of a breakdown in tensions and the continual Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, especially at a time when Italy was not, Italy's surrender was not accepted by the USSR, Eastern European states were not accepted by the USSR, and the Soviet Union were given no power in the post-war domination of Japan. Thank you.